in depression. And this is the reason why people commit suicide. If God will just open up, we will be surprised that this demon is very active even among the people around us. Even in church. I hope not. But it could be also present here in house. There were clothes. I know, I know Jacob, who by the grace of God has been winning over it, being a witness to someone who committed suicide. While they were, while he was in the service, just walking around with his friend, and the friend said, okay, let's go to the armory, and when they go to the armory, she picked up a handgun and shot herself beside, right by the side of Jacob. That trauma, you know, it's real. Before, now next week, I want to speak to you about How there are even su suicidal, uh, how there are even suicide inc incidents of suicide in the Bible. There are seven of them, actually. And the Bible speaks about it. Even the famous prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19, he said, Lord, I'm good for nothing, take my life. After just encountering a very big miracle. So this hopers, this family of God, this evil is very rampant. This evil is so cunning. That's why we need to be in the know. We need, we need to be informed. And we need to be transformed. But at the same time, let us equip ourselves so we can be a blessing to others. Who may want to commit suicide? My last slide, I believe, is uh, taken from the famous Psalm in Psalms 46, verse 1, when it says, God is our strength, a very present help, ever present help in time of trouble. If we would just only sink our minds and sink our heart to this verse. That God is our refuge. That God is our strength. That God is a very present help. Faster than 911. Hello? Right? In times of trouble. Now, as I close <coughs> talking about this subject. Even in my own family, it happened. I'm not talking about, oh, pastor, your family. And many of you will say, oh, pastor, I admire your family. All of you are serving God. Mm -hmm. And, and all, you have all uh, kids who are very smart, very beautiful, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they, they all love God. They, they all grew up in church. And you know about this. They have talked about it. They have, they have spoken about it. And this unique and family. And we're talking about, I was, I almost fell off my chair when I heard it. They say it here, inside, here, in this pulpit. So last night I asked Eunice to just share share what was, what happened, why, how, and how, thank God, she overcame it. 
you know, because this is very, very serious. So at this time, before we, uh, before, uh, we close, I'd like to call on Yunin's sister, Yunin. <laughs> suicide because what he's like what he said it's not just people who don't believe in God you know like I grew up in the church um, I grew up singing songs about God's love and uh, I grew up experiencing God's love and his presence and uh, that's the environment I grew up in I didn't grow up in like a loveless environment I didn't grow up in um, a hostile environment uh, from outside looking in, it seems like uh, my childhood was perfect, and I had the best loving parents, and you know I had ooh, kind of <laughs> yeah exactly. I had a loving parents, a loving church, a good community. Um, but like what my dad said, and what is reality is that you just because you're a Christian, just because you know God, doesn't mean you're exempted from that kind of spiritual warfare doesn't mean you're exempted from that kind of pain doesn't mean you're exempted from that kind of struggle so um when i came up here i think it was good friday and i kind of opened up about my experience with it um it was a hard decision for me because i didn't know how to approach it but he, uh, my dad came up to me last night and said, I want you to open up about your experience with it and what was happening and why. Um, so, unlike, I know for some people there's there's a huge tragedy, a loss, uh, a, a, a really traumatic and emotional event that, that triggers, you know, suicidal thoughts and triggers this, you know, that mindset of let me just end my life. Uh, for me personally, there wasn't a big event or a big tragedy or a big loss. Um, for me, it was a lot of little things. A lot of little things that just kept adding up and adding up and building up and building up over time. And uh, instead of getting help, instead of acknowledging it, uh, a lot of the person that actually went through it at a time kind of made me feel weaker for it because I thought of, I had these thoughts. So the person I went to at the time made me feel weaker for it and made me feel like I wasn't a good Christian and that I didn't really believe in God and love God because I'm having thoughts of ending my life. So I was like, okay, whatever. And I was already, I was a sophomore in high school when it started becoming more real, when it started becoming more present, I guess, growing up. Um, it's a lot of little things, like I said. It's not just one big thing, so. There was a time when I was in, when I was uh, a teenager where I didn't feel like I deserved to be in church. And I didn't feel like I deserved to be in the presence of God, to experience God's love and the blessings that he's given me. I felt like I didn't deserve it. You know, I felt like worthless. Um, I felt like there was really nothing that I 
can offer or nothing that I can give that was worth it or that was important. And uh, I didn't feel any of that. And um, so yeah, that's why I wanted to do it. And it's not a big event, like I said, it was a lot of little things that just built up, built up over the years. You know, I was bullied as a kid because I was different. We grew up in Singapore and I was bullied because I had dimples <laughs> and I was bullied because I was darker than them. I was bullied because my hair wasn't that perfect Asian straight hair. <laughs> and I hated all those things about me growing up. I hated my hair, I hated my dimples, I hated being tan, you know, I hated it growing up. I didn't think I was beautiful, I didn't think I was good enough, I didn't think I was worthy of love. And then as a teenager, it just doubled over to like my walk with God. I didn't think I was worthy to to do anything for God because of who I am, because you know, I'm a sinner, Every, yeah, everyone's a sinner, I know, but for me, I felt like the things I was struggling with and the things that I was dealing with as a Christian made me not worthy of his love and not worthy to be used and stuff. So that is why I wanted to end my life. And then, as you guys know, um, I went a step further from like thinking about it, I went a step further from ideation, I went to like planning, and um, I mean, I don't want to get graphic about it or like be go in detail, but I, I had it planned out and I had the things that I needed for it um, because at the time I had friends who, yeah. So I had plans for it, and then by the grace of God, you know, I got home that day and I was ready and I was saying, like, you know, this is. I was in a very, very dark and lonely place, and I felt like I wasn't, no one really needed me and stuff, so, I mean, I know that's a lie, like what, yeah. what he said, it's a lie, it's little whispers that embed in your heart over time, little whispers that, that, that just consumes your soul and consumes your, your heart, and over time it just builds up and builds up and builds up until one day you're, you're, you snap and you just say, I, I don't want to do this anymore. So that's that's what was going through my mind. And, and I had planned. And that very day, I went home. And you guys know, you know, Pen was doing, I don't know, he was baking. <laughs> he was baking. And then as I got in the door, this little chunky Pen was like <laughs> fussing over burnt cookies. And I know I, I tell this to everyone. and. I keep repeating the story, but it needs to be said. It needs to, I want to tell you guys that because of my brother, I felt like I had, oh, it's so cheesy. I had a reason to be around. Something as simple as help with cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked at him and I said, I thought to myself, and I know it was God whispering and I know it was Jesus intervening and and I know it, you know, because something as simple as a cookie, a burnt cookie, and I was looking at Penn and I was thinking like, even something as small as this is worth to be around. It's worth to be here for. So that's why I didn't do it. Um, like I said earlier, I think it's time for us as a church, as believers, as um, advocates of God and Jesus' love. I think it's time we need to start changing the narrative when it comes to people who are suicidal, or when it comes to people who are depressed, or when it comes to people who have anxiety or all these mental illnesses. It's time for us to change the way we view them. It's time, it's time for us to change the way we treat them. And it's time for us to change the way we talk to them. Because, like I said, it's not only the people of the world or the people who aren't in church. It affects everybody, you know. And um, I just want to read really quick. Sorry, I know that I'm supposed to not close, but I just want to read this really quick. So we are Christians, we are Christ-like, we take after God and Jesus and what he did. I want to talk about, um, I want to read Mark chapter 5 about this demon-possessed man that was 
outcast and marginalized and was not accepted by society at all. He was the least, the last, and the lonely, basically. And I want to, I want to talk about what Jesus actually did for him. Um, so blah, blah, blah. When Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came out from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in, a bur in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained, even with chains. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed shackles. The shackles, sorry. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And it says here, day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling in pain and cutting himself with sharp stones. But when Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him and bowed to his feet and said, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus has already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, because there are many of us inside this man. And I'm not going to read the rest. I'm just going to tell you what happened. So Jesus, this man is delivered from all the spirits that was in him. And when he was saying he was clothed and, and he was healed from all of this, all these oppressing demons and spirits inside him, um, when Jesus left, he asked, he asked, the man asked him, can I go with you? Let me go with you. But Jesus told him something very interesting, because usually, remember the, the, the rich, what was it, the rich? Young ruler. The young ruler. And he said, uh, Master, what would I do to, you know, and then Jesus told him, give up everything and follow me. But he told his guys the opposite. He said, stay. And Jesus told to him, no, go home to your family and to your hometown and tell them everything the Lord has done for you. Tell them about how merciful, how merciful I have been. And so the man started off and, and became and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus did for him. And everyone was amazed by his story. Um, to, I guess to close or to reiterate, I want to say that us as a church need to talk about how his love transformed us yeah. instead of why you should be transformed. Us as a church need to start talking about our brokenness. We need to start talking about what makes us stay up all night, howling in pain or whatever, our stress. Don't be scared of your shame. Because that is eventually what he will use to help other people. Um, we were saying earlier that there's nothing worth more and nothing will ever come close to his presence. And I've tasted and seen the deepest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is in them. And it is only with the presence of God. And it pains me to, to think about people, famous, young, old, rich, poor, whatever, to think about people who feel like they're hopeless, and to feel like there's no answer, and who feel like there's nothing to live for, it, I, my heart breaks for them, more so than their family. I, I know their family is hurting, but my heart breaks for those people. Because I know that Jesus' heart breaks for those people. That's not his promise. He doesn't want you to feel hopeless. He doesn't want the darkness to overcome you. You know, he, he built this our lives and so we're surrounded by love and beauty and that's not what Jesus wants for these people. You can say that they're crazy. You can say that they're mentally unstable. You can say that they're you can look at them the way that people looked at that demon possessed man but the truth is Jesus literally went through a storm to get to that man just to save him. Man. And if we can't reach out to those people the way he did then who are we really? And who are we helping? So us, as a church, as a family of God, need to start changing the way we think. And need to start changing the way that we judge. And we can't even judge. We can't. 
Because who are you to judge another person's struggle? Who are you to judge another person's mental health? Like, we're, we can't. You know, Jesus didn't even judge this guy. So, yeah, that's just, that's what I have to say. Okay, I guess I'm holding. So let's play, um, bow our heads and close our eyes. Uh, let's just stand up. Let's all just close our eyes and open up our hearts and open up our minds to this reality, to this evil. It might not be affecting you, but you might encounter someone who is being affected by it. God in heaven, we welcome you to this place and we welcome you to our hearts. More than the name of depression, more than the name of anxiety, more than the name of insecurities, Jesus' name reigns over all. More than our weakness, your strength is sufficient. Yes. More than our darkness, your light is sufficient. Yes. And Lord, when we're howling and going back to dead places, roaming in dead places, you have shown time and time again that you will leave the 99 just to find us. Yes. We have experienced your love. We have tasted the kind oh, of peace you offer. We have tasted the kind of joy that you bring. And we've tasted the freedom of your spirit of, of, of loving you, of being with you, of accepting you. And may we reflect that, God. May we be your reflectors. May we be the ones who always have a smile on our face. May we be the ones, God, who always shows kindness and joy and mercy just like you and spread your love spread your name instead of putting them down God may we lift these people up because yeah. they are still precious they are still lives they are still people that you died for same as us we cannot judge all we can do is love ultimately judgment belongs to you and our sole purpose in this world God is to make everyone that's around us feel safer, feel better, feel loved, feel like there's hope and a future for them, and empower your people this morning, God. Amen. Yeah. Even those who, who who just who still are a little standoffish with this topic, God, empower them. Yeah. As we stand in your presence, as we bow our hearts to you, Father, we welcome you and we lift those people up, whoever they may be. If that is you, talk to him. If you've been thinking lately that you're worthless, maybe not suicidal ideation, but it begins in your heart and it begins in your mind. So if you lately you've been thinking like nothing is working out, Lord. Nothing is happening in my life. If lately you've been thinking, God, what am I here? What is my purpose? What is my calling? If lately you've been thinking that I'm not loved, I'm not good enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough. If lately you've been thinking those things, I want you to tell yourself that Jesus died so that I can be free. Hallelujah. That Jesus died so that I can be alive. Stop going back to dead places. Hallelujah. And be transformed. You are so real. You are so real. And we welcome you in this place. And Holy Spirit, we ask you just to move in this place. Yes. 
move in this place. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to celebrate, so much to be thankful for and celebrate. And empower us, God, and then we worship you, we worship you, and we give you everything that we have. And as we go through our week, as we go through our lives, as we go through the second chapter of this series, God, may you continue to open up our minds and open up our hearts, God, and may we be used by you. And may we really change and, and be and represent your love, God. Jesus. Amen. Let, let us recommit our lives to God. If you have not fully surrendered your life to Jesus, if you have not fully surrendered your life to God and have not made Him your Lord and your Savior yet, maybe you've been coming to church, maybe you've been here for years, but you have not really surrendered your life to God and recommend or maybe you, you're a Christian who have slid down and 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 had taken it easy and, and, and but they have discovered you are far away from God already. Let us come to God and recommit our lives to Him. Let's put our hands in our heart and say Jesus Forgive me from all of my shortcomings. Forgive me from all of my sins. And today, I open my heart. I invite you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I will follow you. I will live for you. Thank you for your love. Let me pray. Father, let your light shine amongst your people. And maybe we are not that Christian who has that suicidal ideation, but my prayer this morning is as like what you miss is shared. Let us be like little Jesus who will reach out to those who need you. Let us be like little Jesus who will go out of their way reaching out to these people who needs you. Lord, they are searching and they thought they cannot find you. They are searching. They thought you're nowhere. That's why they want to end it. God, let us be your instruments. Let us be your mouthpiece. Let us be your arm to hug them. Let us be your instrument, Lord, to tell them that someone loves them. Someone died on the cross for them. And someone can give them hope. Yeah. Oh, Father, I pray. As we commit our lives, we also commit our lives to be used. So that this evil of suicide will be controlled and eventually stop from stealing the lives of precious people who has a full potential to enjoy eternal life in you and even prosperous and blessed life here on earth. We commit this time. We commit our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Wow. Let's give that a That this meeting here this morning is far more than just a Sunday morning for us, right? God is just so wonderful. Every time we meet on a Sunday morning, as if there will be no tomorrow. As if this is the last day we'll be having our church. The way we sing, the way we shout, the way we worship. It's as if there's no tomorrow. You know, and, and this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Amen. Amen. Part of our worship is we give him our tithes and our offering. And those who have not given their mission pledges, this is the time for us to express our love for the people. Let me call on Pastor June. Hello. Hello, everyone. Let us thank the Lord. Thank you very much for our release who gave this year. Amen. Uh, before I, I pray, you know. You will give me a chance to exert. Can I? Sure, of course. Uh, regarding Proverbs 19, verse 17, says, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, 
and He will reward them for what they have done. Amen. Amen. So.